All right, so uh, my name is Rich, Rich Kwok. So I run Remax uh, by the Bay and Easy Qualify. We have two different brands for loans. Um, we basically do these free trainings every quarter. And the reason we do it is because we want to help the agents um, you know, do loans because we want the customers to have choices when they get a loan. Okay, we don't think they should just choose between Bank of America and Wells Fargo. We want them to have more choices. Yeah, come on. So that's why we do these trainings. We believe um, in wholesale, we want to be able to offer customers better options. And we believe that agents like myself that do both real estate and loans, we can do a good job for the customer where we're not going to have to rip them off like those old days. So, so that's why we do these trainings, even though there's no charge. We want to help everyone um, pass it because we believe in um, the industry. So that being said, um, before we get started, um, just a little bit of a brief, this little pack right here is just a little bit of the leads that we get as Remax. And on the very back, you can see our associates are making really good money. <clears throat> but, of course, it's not always about the money. One of the best things about having a loan license is the ability to call to contact the customer again and again. Okay, For example, sell a house. Six months later, especially if the property went up in value, I can get rid of the mortgage insurance. So the customer is really happy. It's all about the touch. You guys heard of touch? Being able to touch touch the customer with um, helping them save money, etc. So the other thing I'm going to pass around is this is basically 161,000. So this is what I made last year just in doing loans. Okay, again, my focus is more real estate, but this will, this is extra money that you ha you can have on the side. It's not a lot of loans, but maybe 20, you know, 20 loans. Um, I do have full time loan officers. They probably make about 300,000, you know, doing five loans a month. Um, but because my focus is kind of split, you know, 161 is not that bad. So it gives you an idea of why, why, um, why you should do it. It, it just it just helps because you get to touch the customer, you earn extra money, and um, you know it just helps overall. Um, for me personally, as my business grows, I um, I have a loan assistant that helps me out. So this way, when it comes to the customer and the paperwork, um, I can let them deal with that. Um, but I still am the face of the communication, so the client always knows me, knows me, hey Rich, help me out, Rich, save me money. You're always thinking that. So it really helps when it comes to, um, to branding yourself and you know winning the customer. One of the best things that I'll, I'll share with you guys is that a lot of lead agents are focused on new customer acquisition. I gotta spend money to get new customers. In reality, um, you don't need to spend money because some of your existing customers may actually want to buy more things with you. All right. So today I had a client text me. He says, "Rich, um, I don't want this property, this fourplex. Uh, how come you didn't tell me about it?" I said to him, "I didn't know you were still buying. One point one million dollar fourplex." Okay. And I and he said, "Well, I'm just looking." But I said, "But I'm thinking to myself. Well, I can refinance his current property. We bought it for seven hundred thousand. It's a duplex. Went up to nine hundred thousand. Cash out. Take the money and do what? Yeah, Buy something else, true. right?" The easiest going customer is your best customer. So a lot of times us agents were trained, oh, we've got to get a new customer, new customer, new customer. It's not the case. So that's why having a loan license really helped my business. I've been doing this for 13 years. I have probably about 300 customers. And um, I could basically make my living off of going the existing database. And that's what I hope that you guys will have too. So let's get started. The test has a couple components. And who here has um, taken the test? Just one person? OK. Uh, two. Okay, great. So it's a uh, it's a very hard test, and um, even me, I took the test in 2010. So I've been doing loans since 2001. So even having nine years of experience, I still didn't pass. Okay, I said, oh my god, I don't need to study. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's a hard test. Okay, it's purposely hard because they want to limit the people that can enter the industry. Now the big banks, do they have to take the test? They don't have to no. take the test. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. they don't. So they. The, they hold us to a higher standard, okay? But um, eventually they will have to take the test. So that being said, the test has a couple components. Um, regulations. If you're good at memorizing stuff, if you're good at the school stuff, going back to school, you know, and memorizing all these different things, you're going to pass the regulation test. Then there's ethics, and then there's practice. So my course, um, I focused on what I didn't pass because for me, um, you know, I want to cover the general area, but I want to focus on the questions. So you may be taking a course because you're required to take a 20-hour course to get your 
your um, education first, and don't necessarily study that. That may not correlate with what the actual test is. Okay, it's all kind of garbage, right? Or, you know, it's this these these questions that we're going to cover later on are the actual questions that were in my test. And the nice thing is people have actually sent us more questions because they say, okay, Richard, we passed it. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you some questions. So we put in our database. So the first thing we were going to cover is regulations. Can everybody see the board okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so regulation X has to do with the HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So I'm going to give you some things that will help you memorize um, everything. So I want you to think of X as RESPA. Okay? So I want you to think of, I want you to write on your notebook X equals RESPA. Okay? X equals RESPA is how I memorize it. I just think of XPA. Okay? I just imagine X P X P A. Easy way to memorize it, okay? This applies to federally mortgage related or federally related mortgage loans, loans that are made with funds insured by the government, loans that are made with funds regulated by a from a lender that's regulated by the government, for example, home savings and FDIC lender, or loans that are intended for sale to Fannie or Freddie. This is typically the case of 90% of loans out there right now. Okay? Every time the customer gets a loan for Bank of America, Wells Fargo, it's still going to go to Fannie or Freddie. Okay? However, recently, we actually have programs right now that are portfolio. So we got Fannie and Freddie, which are like a box, and then we now have portfolio lenders. So we have programs like um, a stated, a stated uh, business owner loan. Okay? This is where the bank is actually lending their own money. Um, obviously, the Fannie and Freddie programs are usually better programs, like 30-year fixed, really cheap rate. Um, anybody know what the rate today is? Is that four? Four point five? Something yeah. like that? Four? Uh, four point one. Okay. Yeah. So it's an amazing rate. As a realtor, when people ask you the question of how's the market, you should always be aware of the rate. And if you and I like Google because if you Google interest rate drop, you're going to find some articles. Okay. So I said to my customer, hey. Now is really a good time to buy. Here's an article that shows that the Fed did not raise the rates, so go ahead and buy. Does that make sense? So know your rates because it's very common. In fact, for an investment property, the rate is between 4.3 and 4.5, which is I'm pretty amazing. All right. It also applies to loans that are made by a creditor, regulated under the Truth in Lending Act. TILA stands for Truth in Lending Act, and we're going to go into that later. All right. So again, we're covering RESPA, okay? These are all RESPA um, related. There are some exceptions. So for loans that are for 25 acres or business or commercial or agricultural purposes, we don't really necessarily, um, we have an exception for RESPA. Loans that are under temporary financing or bridge loans. Loans that are for vacant land are also exceptions for under RESPA. Loans that are used to construct a manufactured home are an exception. Loans that are sold in the secondary market are an exception. And loan conversions. So think of the bridge loan, except instead of being a temporary loan, it automatically converts into a fixed product. Okay? We're going to start to see a lot of this, okay? because right now it kind of reminds me of the time frame of 2004. In the business, we're going to start to see a lot of aggressive programs coming back to the market. So I'm very excited about that. Now for the test, this is the most important part. Okay? So for example, um, Let's say that uh, somebody refers me a loan. Can I pay them? A referral fee? Not unless they have a license. Not unless they have a license? Thank you. Not unless they have a license. Um, what if they have a license? Can I simply pay them a referral fee? No, I don't. There's so the referral, referral fees? Yes. Okay. If, I, if they have a license, if say, okay, license. you can take my class, you pass the test. Hey, Rich, I'm going to give you a loan. I want uh, 50%. Can I do that? Well, if that is according to the referral. So, so a lot of people will say no. The answer is actually more complicated than that. You have to actually document the work that was done. So, yes, they have to be licensed. But the work that was done should be commensurate with what you pay them. All right? So it just can't be, here, here's a phone number, go call them. All right, a lot of people will do that to me. Um, you must disclose any affiliate business arrangements. This is a giant red flag. A lot of um, real estate companies uh, own an escrow company, okay? I would never own an escrow company, even though it has extra money, 
because that's such a big, big risk. Okay, you got liability on the agency side, and you got liability on the clothing side. Let's see. So um, essentially, uh, these are the two things that are most important that have to do with Section 8. Okay, so think of Section 8, not the housing Section 8, but the rest of Section 8. Okay, you must dispose any field business arrangements, and you must be aware of any kickbacks. All right. Now, yield spread premium. What's another name for yield spread premium? Rebate. Rebate. So, who owns the rebate? Is it the escrow company? Is it the loan originator? Is it the borrower? Is it the broker? I guess the loan originator. I guess the loan originator. So the answer is actually yeah, in 2000, before 2010, the broker owned the rebate, yield spread premium. Okay. After 2010, it now belongs to the clients. Okay. Oh, that's, the client. that's why the clients will receive a credit towards their closing costs. And I'll go into more details later. So essentially, that's what the effective change of 2010 was. Okay? The good news is clients said, hey Rich, um, you know what, uh, can I get more? Can I get more credits? What's my answer? Yeah. No, you can't. Everything is fixed. So the government in 2010 fixed everything. My compensation is fixed. The client's rebate is has to do with their scenario. Okay, so. Um, can you pass that around still, the, the, loan, the loan sheet right there? So on one of the transactions on the loan sheet, $23,000, okay? That was my commission on one deal. The loan amount was 700000 but there was no negotiation because the client saved about $1,000 a month, okay? He's super happy, but at the same time, that $23,000 that I earned is a fixed amount. Does it make sense? I cannot prefer one person over the other. Does it make sense? So, it is intended to provide a resource for originators to subsidize borrower closing costs. That was the original intention, okay? So, um, essentially, you know, when I started doing loans in 2001, I was kind of questioning, hey, how come that loan officer is giving you all this credit for their commission? Why are they doing that? And I, I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. But then in 2010, all the rules changed. All right. So it's, it's easier in the sense that, number one, a customer wants to negotiate with me, I say I can't do anything, this is the law, I can't give you extra, I can't charge you more, I can't charge you less. Um, and the good thing for the customer is that it's full disclosure as well. So why is this based on the loan amount? Why is is always going to be based on the loan amount, because that is the only thing that is there. But there are other factors as well. For example, the credit score of the borrower, the type of property they're buying, Things that cannot change, so it cannot be based on the age of the borrower or the race of the borrower or how much income they make. It all has to do with the property and the scenario. Okay. Any questions? All right. So the next thing is closing cost disclosures. So the most important thing is the good faith estimate, which basically has to be provided within three business days after receipt of the loan application. Okay. Now, in further text, you have to know this. Business days for the closing costs do not include federal holidays, Sundays, or Saturdays. Okay. There are some disclosures that will include Saturdays, but for the closing costs on the good fit estimate, they do not include um, holidays and Sundays and Saturdays. Okay. The key word here is three business days. Now, um, as you're aware, I, I don't know if you guys have, have any people have seen a good fit estimate after 2010. It's still very confusing. A lot of clients want to know how much I can bring in. It doesn't really tell you too much. So whenever I submit the good faith estimate, I attach an escrow closing statement and say this is this is what goes with it. Okay. And next year they're probably going to change it. So the questions there's questions that the, the business days including it's not including Sunday, it'll, it'll be, Sunday and yeah. So for this disclosure, it does not include Sundays or Saturdays. There is another disclosure that will include Saturdays, and we'll go through that in a second. Okay, but for the GFE, no Sundays or Sundays, so no weekends. No weekends at all. Now, the good investment is not, does not provide until the subject property is identified. So what that means is that I can basically go ahead and submit my loan, 
no good faith estimate. Um, anybody know what that's called? I don't have a property. I want to get the loan approved. Here's the call. It's called a TBD approval to be determined. Okay. And who here represents buyers? Unfortunately, right? Who here represents buyers? Okay. Um, one of the secrets that I use to get my offer accepted is um, I provide a TBD lender approval. So I say, listen, um, all the other brokers out there are providing a one page letter that says so and so is approved. Okay. I'll go ahead and submit my loan in under TBD with an underwriter signature and then I'll beat that offer. All right. It works. Um, if you look up a property called 408 Fuller Avenue, um, I sold that one with the 18 offers. My client only had 7% down. It was FHA. Okay. So people say, oh my God, how did you get that accepted? Well, that's my secret. All right. Um, so basically, the good faith estimate, the estimate must be reasonable. Okay. Remember, we don't know a lot of variables here, but we should by, know by now if the, what the customer's credit score is. We should know also if they are, um, if it's buying a condo or single family. We should know things like that, right? So within what we know, it should be reasonable, okay? Why is P has to be included on the good faith estimate? So that means how much credit. Now, when do you actually get the credit? When does the actually get the credit? Well, they know for sure how much credit they're getting. Uh, before that. Because we don't like surprises, right? And That's the one. Pre-qualification, and they are pre-qualified. Nope. Because let's say the pre-qual was done many months ago, things have changed, right? Rates have changed, so therefore the credit has changed. So, any other answers? The answer is when you lock it, right? Um, when you lock the rate, yeah. that means the bar wants to get this rate. Um, so therefore, the YSP that's included on the good estimate is always going to be an estimate. Until we actually lock the rate, we'll know exactly how much credit they're going to get. Does that make sense? And one thing I would suggest for your business, this is what I do for my business, but one thing I suggest is um, I always provide the customer with different rate options. Okay. One thing I learned in sales is that when you give the customers options, you either confuse them that you win their business or you win them because you explain things. So that's basically how I operate. Now, it's mandatory as of January. Charges cannot differ by 10%. That's a test question. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm sorry. Excuse me. When you lock in the interest rate, is it only good for 30 days? When you lock the interest rate, is it only good for 30 days? Mm -hmm. The answer is it depends on the lock period. It depends on the lock period. So, for example, if it's, um, if they, if they're writing contract, um, I might do a 20 day lock or 21 day lock. All right. If it's uh, a complicated deal, I might do a 60-day lock, etc. So that's basically um, what it is. I usually know, excuse me, I usually know what the exact closing date is, and then pretty much only the variables that will change is what interest rate do you want. What's your name? Marcia. Marcia. So Marcia, here's 4.1. You're going to get a thousand dollar credit. 4.2. You're going to get two thousand dollar credit towards your closing costs. 4.3. You're going to get a five thousand dollar credit. So I'm giving you all these options here. I usually know the period. So um, if the loan originator closes the transaction, uh, I should say 30, uh, the, basically 30 days, and then exceeds the amount of good faith estimate, he or she has 30 days to cure the excess charges. Okay? Records must be kept for three years. Remember that these records are having to do with also matching the DRE requirements too. Okay? Um, in, this, in essence, um, three years is requirements. Now, who here has been audited before? Not by the IRS, but by the DRE. The DRE. Or, okay, so, so we've been audited by um, the department corporations. The most important thing in an audit is excess charges. So what they look for is they go through the appraisal. They say, okay, the borrower was charged $425. How much did you actually collect? $430. Oops. You're going to give them back, what, $5. Okay. So it always has to do with the charges. All right, here are some exceptions, okay? Because everything can change, you know, in a heartbeat. Um, so you provide the good faith estimate. Things that may change are, let's say the property burns down, uh, acts of God, war, disaster, emergencies. Any information found to be inaccurate at the borrower to provide the initial good faith estimate. So that means the borrower credit quality. 
So for example, they say I have good credit, you give them an estimate, they don't have good credit. Now in reality, I never quote a borrower without running the credit, because why would I want to give them an inaccurate quote? Does that make sense? So essentially, um, if we discover that something is different, okay, for example, what's very common here is you run the deal as a uh, single family attached, but then later on you discover, oops, it's a condo that looks like a townhouse. Okay, possibility. Or you look at the prelim, it goes from free simple to condominium interest. Now all of a sudden you've got add-ons that will affect the interest rate. That's when you would actually um, uh, be okay with changing it. Anything such as boundary disputes, need for fund insurance. How people here have done deals in Santa Clara or Willow Glen? I mean, now it's getting really extreme where we're having to have flood insurance for these properties. All right. So these things are going to affect the estimates because remember, the good faith estimate should include these charges. And all of a sudden, when you have a flood insurance that's fourteen hundred dollars a year or three thousand dollars a year, that's going to affect the closing. All right. Now, if you have to make corrections, you've got three business days to give the corrections. So if you have needing to make any corrections. If there's any issues um, that have changed, you basically can give them a corrected good faith estimate. Okay? That means that if you're really tight on the deal and you've got, like all my deals, 21 day close of escrow, that three days is going to cost you lots of time. right? So you want to make sure that you provide an accurate one from the beginning. Um, settlement cost booklet, I thought I had one, but um, basically it's a, uh, it's a little half page booklet that provides you with what's common. So this is usually mailed by the lender to the borrower and provided within three business days. It says, what are the common closing costs that you should pay? Escrow, uh, recording fees, government fees, funding fees, etc. So that's what's provided. Now, disclosures. Okay, Mortgage servicing. This disclosure simply says that we, easy qualify, we do not service the loans. Another lend a lender will be taking care of the servicing for your loan. That's important to borrowers because they want to know what's going to happen. At the same time, um, they're also provided from the lender with a percentage of how often they service the loan. For example, if it's a small lender, they will probably not be servicing the loan. They don't have the capacity to do so, and therefore 100% of loans will probably be serviced by that by another lender. Okay. Now, um, I'll go over to their transfer requirements later because when they do transfer the loans, there are some requirements that you should be aware of. Affiliate business arrangements. So let's say that settlement service provider, okay? Anybody know what other name for settlement service provider is? What's another name? Who handles settlement? Escrow. Escrow, okay? So if escrow refers to an affiliate business, you have to dispose it. Alright? But at the same at the same time, this is typically done, remember I said earlier that if a real estate brokerage owns an escrow company. That's a, that's a big red flag. So that's basically what's being covered here. Now, it includes any ownership interest, even if it's just a small amount. It's legal. It's not illegal, but it just has to be disclosed to the client. Within the HUD-1, as you guys remember, the HUD-1 um, includes a spreadsheet of everything that's involved between a borrower and a seller. Okay, so on the test, it might ask you, is a HUD-1 for the buyer only? The answer is, no. No. It's for buyer, buyer and, and seller. Okay. Um, in other words, if I want to see how much the other agent is making, I look on the HUD. You can remember the buyer. I can see it broken down there, right? The it that way. Um, how about this? Uh, does a cash buyer deal need a HUD one? Yeah. Yeah. Cash buyer. Um, the answer is no. So unless you specifically ask the escrow company for a HUD one. Then you don't need it. They don't. They will actually not do it unless you actually ask. Okay. Now here's a little trivia fact that is not on the test, but we have a program where if they put down cash, they can get the cash out right away, within 30 days. It's called delayed financing. So they can get out 60, 65 percent is a sweet spot. They can get out a little bit more if they want to. Um, so my recommendation is if you have a cash buyer, ask for the HUD one anyway, because that will be a requirement when they refinance. Okay. Because again, what I say earlier, you might as well sell them another property. If they're a nice client, you know, treat you nice, you might as well sell them something else. The borrower has the right to, re to, to request a copy one business day before signing, okay? 
So this way there's no surprises. This is called shell shock, by the way, if there are surprises, even though we're not turtles. This is called shell shock. All right, they go to signing, they say, oh my god, I have to bring in an extra 5% to close this deal. This is the whole reason these regulations occurred. So the bar can say, hey, wait a minute, before I sign, I need to see the closing statement. Can you imagine that, the borrowers having these rights? <laughs> so basically, um, if it cannot be done, then it has to be done as soon as practical after closing. Now you're going to say, Rich, wait a minute. How come they're going to mail it after closing, after they sign? Any idea? What do they sign in escrow? What do they sign besides all the paperwork for the loan and the escrow instructions? They sign the closing statement. Is it final or is it estimate? Final. Actually, no. It's an estimate. Yep. Right? It's an estimate. It's always going to be an estimate because the close of escrow hasn't occurred yet. The recording date is when they do the final. So everybody remember that. When they when they, when they they call you a week later and they say, hey, I got something in the mail. It's got a red stamp on it. It's from the escrow company. That's the final one. Okay? And the final one also comes with what? Your favorite thing? Your paycheck, right? Your commission check. They send you the final version. So very, very important because if the borrower is not closing, the final version must be mailed after closing. Does that make sense? Um, now let's talk about this, okay? Because we use the word escrow to make to mention settlement provider, but another verbiage for escrow, because this is really confusing, is impounds. That's where you pay your taxes and your insurance with your loan. So when is the uh, impound account created? Anybody know? When do we create the impound account? Going yeah. Do they call the bar and say, hey, get up. Get, you decided to pay your, pay your taxes and your insurance with your mortgage. I want to need $5,000. Do they do that? When you're in contract escrow account. So we're not talking about the escrow account where you put yeah. your deposit in. We're talking about impounds. Okay? This is where you pay your taxes and your insurance with your loan. So who here has impounds? When you close escrow, it's already in there. The uh -huh. PITI. Yeah. yeah. How many months? They always have it two months, one month. It depends on, the, on, on when you close. It could be as high as six months, and it could be as short as two months. Okay? So you always want to disclose with uh, the worst case scenario. So, therefore, um, they collect the money in escrow. So if the borrower chooses impounds, they get a little bit of a discount on the interest rate. Very, very small, like a couple hundred bucks. So they can collect up to six months, huh? They can collect up to six months, because depending on what the season is. They only collected one month on it. Well, you got lucky. However, if they find that they don't have enough money, they basically have to do an analysis annually. They'll say, uh, Mar Mar Lou, right? Marsha. 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 Um, guess what? We didn't collect enough money for you in escrow. Property taxes are this. We only have this. Therefore, you must pay the difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that analysis annually. Um, and obviously right now, with taxes going up, um, we're having a lot of clients saying, hey, wait a minute, I, I, I got a shortage. So you want to be aware of that. If there is a surplus, however, they have to refund you over 50 bucks within 30 days. Okay. Section 6 requires that the borrower have these 15 days notice prior to transfer. So now we're talking about something different. So this part right here covers the impounds. This part right here, called Section 6, talks about the transfer. So what did we say earlier? Okay. If the lender is a small lender, are they going to transfer their loan? If the lender is a small lender, yeah. they need to. Think about it this way. Okay. They don't have enough funds because you know they're going to sell them to Fannie Mae. They're going to sell the servicing rights. They're going to collect extra money for doing that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Maybe to a big lender, GMAC, City Mortgage. But that notice has to be given at least 15 days prior. Okay. So I had a client where um, it was over the holiday, December holiday. And they did not receive the notice. I said, well, you have a you have a violation here because Section 6 requires it to be done within 15 days. The new loan service provider must also provide a notice within 15 days. So, easy qualify, sends a notice out, saying the loan's being transferred. City Mortgage says, we're now your new lender. Here's a payment coupon. Okay? All 15 days. Okay? Now, one thing interesting, cannot assess late fees. 
for a total of 60 days after transfer. Does that make sense? Okay, my client in this situation was actually Mark Lee. But she wasn't too happy about that. It was over Christmas holiday. We called the lender uh, first something, and uh, they're probably out of business now. And, um, you know, we took care of that because she had a mortgage lien. So X, what did we associate with X earlier when I said X equals what? Respa. Respa. Good. Good class. So, um, and then it has to do with kickbacks. So now we're going back to Respa. Here's the key questions when it comes to Respa. Were the services actually performed for the compensation paid? And was the payment actually reasonable and related to the service? So let me give you an example. Um, in RESPA, let's say that I took the application. Here's the charger if you need it. Let's say I took the application and um, I set the disclosures down. That could be sufficient enough for me to earn a referral fee, provided I'm licensed. But if I simply gave the phone number, it may not be sufficient. So that's the question of RESPA and kickbacks. Violation, you'll need notice for the test, going up to $10,000 and one year in prison. All right, so that's the penalties. The whole goal is that the customer gets adequate information for them to shop effectively. That means that they are prevented from having surprise settlement costs. All right, so the customers have the most options here. The truth in lending provides a comparison of the cost of the ownership, so we'll go into that later, okay, APR, etc. So I want you to write down on your thing B E C O A, okay? That's going to help you remember B C O A. Okay. Regulation B is ECOA. Now, on here it says avoid discriminatory treatment of credit applicants. I cannot discriminate based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, or if they have assistance from a public program. How about disability? Can I discriminate based on disability? No. No. So even though it's listed here, within the guidelines here, on the test it will actually ask a question about uh, disability. It applies to extensions of credit for business, commercial, and agricultural use as well. So you notice how, remember how uh, RESPA had some exceptions, like vacant land, bridge loans. For ECOA, or they call it BCOA, there's exceptions for, there's, uh, there's no exceptions for those type of properties, business, commercial. Okay, does that make sense though? Because you're lending money, you can't discriminate, um, now here's the here's the thing that is also on the test. As soon as they get denied, if they get denied, they must have this notice of action taken. Okay, the most common action taken notice um, is incomplete. That means I didn't really get all the tax returns, um, and therefore I couldn't make a decision. If you get denial, you have to say, okay, you got denied, but we did not discriminate. All right. So that's that's the rule that that has to do with the COA. Just this, um, this law basically requires that disclosure. We do not discriminate, but by the way, you can receive your appraisal report as long as requested within 90 days. 91 days, I don't provide okay. In practice, of course, uh, borrowers usually get the copy of the credit report ahead of time because usually that's who pays for it. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, on your thing, I want you to write Z and then I ILA, so Zilla. All right, remember our favorite website that's 100% accurate for getting comps? Zillow, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I want you to think of Zillow, okay, when it comes to that, because that's that's an easy way to remember it, okay? Regulation Z is Truth in Lending Act, okay? The Truth in Lending Act created the Consumer Credit Protection Act. This is another name for it. It was done in 1968. What it does is it discloses the costs and the terms of the credit. So whenever you get those things in the mail, those little tiny credit card things, you say, oh my god, this is such fine print. Um, it says, okay, your credit card is changing. This is a result of the Truth Lending Act. It protects consumers by disclosing the costs and the terms of the credit. All right, what is the true cost? Is there an annual fee? What's the APR? Is there a balance transfer fee? Things like that that are very um, good information. So it doesn't just apply for loans. It also applies for any type of time they borrow. Now, it also has to make sure that the credit advertising is truthful. So for our industry, that's where we have the APR, annual percentage rate. Okay, so in the front door, you'll see 3.5% APR, um, no co closing cost loan. That's where this comes in. For credit card, it's 0% APR for 12 months. That's basically how um, credit card companies advertise. 
You can also have the bar rescind it so they come into escrow signing and they're not comfortable with the transaction, provided it's a refinance. They can rescind it within three business days. Okay. So, do we go over, everybody understand what the creditor is? What is a creditor defined as? A creditor is someone that lends money on a regular basis. Okay. This is how they define it more than one close end loan in a 12 month period. So let's say I have my uncle, Uncle Sam, let's say. He, uh, he lent me, uh, he wants to help me buy this property, he lent it to me one time, one time deal. Does he have to give me a disclosure saying that he did not discriminate and all that stuff? No. But if Uncle Sam is lending money to <coughs> a lot of people, that's his business, he has to do that, even if he's a private person. Um, now there are two rescissions available. So the first rescission that we're all familiar with is the three, three business day rescission. This is called the cooling off period. Okay, for those of you that also do, uh, do short sale offers, everybody remembers the NODPA. What does the NODPA do? It does the same thing. It says, dear homeowner, before this investor, horrible investor, is going to take advantage of you, we want to make sure that you thought about taking the offer. So therefore, you have a three business day decision if you want to back out. Okay, it's the same customer rights. Now, the other thing that it does too is that for three years, it actually allows it to rescind the whole loan. Now you're saying, wait a minute, Rich, if I borrow 500000 then they didn't provide me with this disclosure, can I get $500,000 free? What's the answer? It could. Anybody know? Lender lent me 500000 They charged me, uh, let's say they charged me $10,000 in cost and points, and I paid. Twenty thousand dollars in interest. Okay, so then I say, wait a minute, you didn't provide me with this truth in lending, so therefore I'm going to rescind my loan. The lender will say, okay, fine, give me back my five hundred thousand. I'm going to waive all the fees. So the principal amount still has to be repaid. All right, that's how you actually can check to see if the lawyer is a scam lawyer or not for the modifications. If they say, no, don't worry, we're going to get your whole loan waived. That's a big red flag. You still have to pay back what was lent. Does that make sense? So the three-year rescission period, um, there are two copies required, three business days. Now you'll notice for this disclosure, a business day does include a Saturday, okay? So the best way to remember it is for the good faith estimate, no weekends. No weekends. For, the, weekends. for a refinance, they're really motivated, they want to refinance, Saturday's included. Does that make sense? So wait, so this is for refi? This is for the rescission period associated with, um, with, with a refi. Okay, if there is a rescission period. And obviously for purchase there's no rescission period, but think of it this way. If you're doing a refinance, the bar probably wants to get the deal done. So why wait, make them wait an extra day? So this includes Saturday. Okay, any questions about that? What, anybody know what created the Patriot Act? I'll give you a clue. It was a big event. Three nice days. 11. Okay. So the Patriot Act was uh, was the whole purpose was to deter and punish terrorist acts in the United States and around the world. Um, therefore, um, as part of this, including um, International Money Laundering Abatement and Anti-Terrorist Financing Act, the Department of Treasury implemented this act. So anytime you deal with money, you have to be aware of the Patriot Act. It does apply to financial institutions, federal related banks, credit unions, branches and agencies, non-federally re regulated private banks, and pe people involved in real estate closing and settlements. That's us. So, um, especially when it comes to loans, what we look for is relationships. So for example, if the customer has a relationship with the bank, um, they might have some exclusions, and they also look for uh, money laundering. Money laundering is defined as filtering ill-gotten money through a series of transactions to prevent the tracing of funds to the original illegal source. All right, not, just, not that a foreigner transferred money to buy a house in the United States. It's that they transferred money to try to uh, get rid of the original source. Um, so what was created was three things. The establishment of the anti-money laundering program an establishment of a customer identification program and sharing information with law enforcement agencies and other financial institutions. In terms of what we do as practice for this, 
what we do um, when we do loans is we must collect information including the name, date of birth, address, and identification number, which is a social security number. And we also have to ask them for their passport number or alien identification card number, called green card, right, for non-U.S. citizens. As practice, we also verify information, such as a driver's license or a passport. Um, in my career, the weirdest thing was uh, we had a client come in and she immigrated to the United States and she had one name, Nancy. Mm -hmm. and I said, are you like, are you like uh, Madonna? You don't have last yeah. name <laughs> or what's going on? And then I had, to, I, I had to say to my team, go ahead and check to see if this is real or fake. <laughs> and I said, did you feel the cards are real? She goes, yeah, that's just how we have it, one, one name. So you might encounter something like that too. We also, um, so our processor fills out a form called the Patriot Act form, where we're required to identify two pieces of information associated with the client. So we ask for the driver's license, and we ask for the green card. Um, and in terms of the banks, they are required to also notify customers verbally or in writing that their, that their identity must be verified before they open a new account. So this was all created after 9-11. Any questions on that? All right, now this one's hard to say. Graham Leach Bliley Act. This is a GLB Act. What this act has to do is privacy. The whole idea is that the customer should know what the financial institution, whether they'll share information, how they use the personal information, and offer customers the opportunity to limit their information, okay? So for example, um, for us, we don't share information. We still have to provide a disclosure and we just tell them to check the opt-out button. We do not share information with third parties. Creating a security program to protect personal information from unauthorized release and disclosure. That's the idea, okay? So if you guys get those uh, junk mails in the mail, there's actually a site you can go to to opt out of that, okay? Optoutprescreen.com. You can say, I don't want to get any more junk mail, okay? Save some time off your life. Um, but for us and a lender, they're required to disclose that information, okay? The customer can send the document in through fax, they can call in the privacy response. Um, this occurs anytime the customer completes an application, they obtain a loan, or the financial institution obtains the servicing rights. That means that the loan is transferred. Does that make sense? So um, in practice, like recently I've, I've opted out of my lender with City Mortgage from getting the disclosures. All of a sudden I get a whole bunch, you know, in the mail. So I know that my opt-out may have expired. I call them up. I tell them, please opt me out again. And they say, okay, we'll do it on record. So that has to do with the GLBF, Graham Leach Black Act. Now, there may be affiliated businesses with the financial institution. For example, City Mortgage, my share information with City Card um, or Citibank, okay? Those are not necessarily the same company. That information has to be disclosed. Do we share a business with affiliated businesses that are owned by the same um, entity? There are opt-out notices that are given, and there are annual privacy notices that are those fine print things that you throw away when you get in the mail. Okay. Now, what happens if there's a violation? Okay. This is actually on the test. What if there's a violation? Who steps in? Anybody know? Is it the Department of Housing, Housing and Urban Development? Is it is it the Federal Trade Commission? Is it the government? Anybody know? Federal Trade Commission. Okay, pretty easy, right? FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Federal Trade Commission. That has to do with the communication. The penalty, if they violate it, is $10,000. Okay? This is similar to the penalty if you call someone on the do not call list. Um, so let's talk about the do not call list because this is where a lot of the test questions are on. They, talk, they think that us originators always call clients and try to get the loans. Okay? You know, I don't do that, but, you know, um, I don't cold call. The Do Not Call Implementation Act was signed in 2003 um, as part of the Telemarketing Consumer Fraud and Abuse Prevention Act. The Do Not Call Act provided, authorized the FTC to implement the Do Not Call Registry. So when you get your list from escrow, um, a lot of times they'll be scrubbed with the Do Not Call list. Um, now, we are required as a business to access the no-call registry every 31 days. The whole idea is that the lists are updated. This way, if there's anybody new that don't want to join the list, they can. Um, you also have to identify the caller. Okay, I can't be pretend I'm rich. You're, 
your rich uncle, I have to identify I'm a mortgage broker, and what's the purpose of the call? To sell goods or services? What is the nature of the goods or services being sold? An assurance that no purchase or payment is required to participate in any type of promotion. Okay, unless a mortgage professional limits his or her calls to individuals with whom there is an established business relationship, it is illegal to initiate calls without accessing, without obtaining access to the general call registry. What does that mean in English? Uh, that means that if I have an old customer that I dealt with a long time ago, I can call them freely. Now, record keeping. Okay, mortgage professionals that are engaged in telemarketing must maintain records for a period of 24 months. That's two years from the date the materials were produced. Okay. Anything you sent to them, advertising, brochures, telemarketing scripts, promotional materials, name and last known address of each customer, the goods and service purchased, and the amount paid for them. So make sure you have a good database because a lot of the CRM systems, you'll be able to, to log in. Okay, I called them this, I sent them this uh, postcard, etc. You cannot threaten them, right, obviously. You cannot use intimidation or profane language. Calls must be placed between, be, Paul, calls must be placed between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Okay. Anything outside um, is a violation. Now, which time is that? Is that their time or our time? It's their time. Our time. <laughs> it's their time. <laughs> <laughs> it's their time. <laughs> yeah, because 9 p.m. here might be 12, 12, 12 in the uh, East Coast. Yeah. Okay. No making false or misleading statement. No requiring payment of a fee um, in advance of obtaining a loan or other extension of credit. No charging consumers for a good or service without consent. No felony to transmit a phone number that cannot be read, okay? You can block your call, your caller ID. Now, again, there's an exception, and the exception is if you have an established relationship with the customer. Here's the penalties, this is what you have to know, okay? Remember the penalty for uh, violating the, um, the GLB Act, which is, has to do with privacy, is what? What was the penalty earlier? Okay, for violating the, for violating the Do Not Call Act, it's actually a little bit higher. It's eleven thousand dollars for each violation. Okay, and each day is considered a separate violation. So if you call the same customer, keep complaining. That's eleven thousand times two. Now, fact that. All right. So in two thousand three, Congress added uh, provisions for fact that they have to do with identity theft, and as well as the free credit report, the ability to get a free credit report, the ability to get a fraud alert on their credit. So let me tell you what happened. So many brokers in the good old days would just say, hey, listen, um, what's your name? Yeah. Rebecca. Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. Also, I'm so sorry. You have horrible credit. So therefore, you're stuck with this loan. You will believe me. But since then, you say, wait a minute. I want to get a copy of my credit report. Okay, that's basically required. I not only have to give you a copy of the credit report, but I have to have you sign an acknowledgement saying that this is your credit score here. So this is what's changed under the FACTA Act. I also have to notify you that if you dispute anything on the credit report, you have the ability to dispute it with the bureaus. Okay? Fraud alerts. Extended fraud alerts. I'm on active duty in the military. The disclosure of credit scores. Um, blocking or freezing of credit scores. Okay? So essentially, um, because of that uh, rule change, now Rebecca is going to know exactly how she qualifies. Okay? No more scare tactics. Um, uh, page 70. Now, with with uh, regard to the red flags, let's look at red flags. Red flags are have to do with trends, trends that are associated with um, with customers. Okay, for example, um, best way to describe it is let's say I go, my credit card company calls me and says, Rich. Did you charge your gas in uh, a gas station in Texas? How do they know that I don't go to Texas? Well, they look for patterns, right? Rich is charging in Costco San Jose, Costco San Jose, Costco San Jose, right? So that's basically the trend. So with this, when it comes to the, the same thing with financial um, services, they have the same rules. They look at financial institutions, creditors, um, or what's called covered accounts. Basically, the creditor is defined again as someone who regularly extends the credit. What they look for are notifications or warnings, such as there is an activity on the account that is inconsistent with the account's prior history. Suspicious documents. That includes tampering documents or information that is not consistent with the borrower's history. Suspicious personal identifying information. 
information does not match the customer's consumer credit report. Okay, so if you ever run credit, you see this, um, you see fraud alerts, red flags. That's because of this. Notices from the customer that fraudulent activity is associated with the account. The customer says, "Hey, wait, you know, in the past I had identity theft violation." So all of these are what we call red flag, and we look for um, excuse me, we look for patterns that have to do with that. Um, there's a couple different. Who regulates fraud? Okay, who regulates fraud? Which government entity regulates fraud? I'll give you a clue. You may not, if you do loans, you may not see it on the fine print, but it's the FBI. All right, mm -hmm. FBI handles uh, fraud in conjunction with HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Okay, all types of different fraud. So, um, let's basically take a quick break, and um, we've got coffee downstairs for you, and then we'll go into some of the questions here.